great honor to be able to do that. Um, Ralph Bradley, Ralph A. Bradley, Ali, with an A, and Peter Hall. Um, and they come from two different parts of the world, as, almost as far away from each other as they could be, and they were born in entirely different times in history. In fact, Ralph had finished his formal statistical training before Peter was born. Anyhow, let me introduce to each of them to you very briefly. I don't want to take Peter's stage from him. So, Ralph Bradley was a Canadian by birth who got his PhD in 1949 at uh, UNC, North Carolina. And uh, apart from his research, which I'll come back to, his main claim to fame um, was his establishment of the uh, Payne, a top rated uh, statistics department under his leadership. So the Department of Statistics at Florida State University. Um, and so it was when we were setting about to, quote, change everything in this department here, um, in 1980, starting in 1980, and at that point were statistics and computer science. Um, it was actually a really big coup, it was a great coup for us to entice Ralph from FSU to come here to assist us in that uh, adventure. Um, Many people, many universities have tried to um, lure it away from FSU, but none of them were successful, fortunately for us. Um, but he was attracted by the challenges that, um, that we had here that were inherent to trying to revamp the program. The faculty, the program, everything, um, including computers and typewriters and you name it. Uh, the only thing that he asked was that we delay his appointment until after he finished his term as ASA president. Not such a bad request. So we granted that request, and so then he came here in 1982. And it's absolutely impossible to underestimate the value of having such a person of his statue amongst the faculty in the department. Um, not only in providing the guidance as we were going about trying to revamp everything, but just the instant visibility he gave us um, by, by being here. But he was also a researcher of note, uh, primarily in paid comparisons and ranked tests. Uh, but more importantly, uh, he firmly believed in the marriage of statistics and science. So let me quote from one of his publications. Um, statisticians must be trained as scientists and to meet the needs of science. These needs surely involve the formulation, modification, and verification of stochastic models designed to represent both structural relationships and dependencies in natural phenomena. Okay? So that sort of thread uh, permeated through everything he did. Uh, research, work, non-research work, that thread was there. That's what drove him. So, Ralph then, Ralph Bradley, is one of the two giants where I'm honoring today, and he's a Canadian, as I said. The other is Peter Hall, who's an Australian. My goodness, what are we doing? Are we honoring the Commonwealth Club today? <laughs> um, and we'll expand that club even more tonight, um, I believe, but I digress. So, Peter. <coughs> Here he is. Um, he received his PhD from Oxford in 1976, and since his first publication in 1977, he's published over two, over 600 journal articles, four books, and still counting. That was last year's number. I don't know what the number is this year. Um, and I say to our graduate students that you're meeting Peter Hall, seeing him in person this week, Day. But all of you have already met him through his published work. And I can say that confidently because the range and value, the value of his contributions is so, so extent that I know you've already met him through his, his work. Um, and his, re his research truly is outstanding. And like Ralph, it was driven by his fascination um, with the real scientific world around him. So let me read an extract on fear from somewhere. Uh, I like uh, Fear is one of the strongest statisticians of our time. The breadth of problems he has tackled and the depth and creativity with which he has solved them, I mean, he has made
made extraordinary and enormously influential contributions to many areas of statistics. He has pioneered important work in a number of areas, and I won't list them off. His research in bootstrap alone has been cited more than, can anyone guess? No, 6,000 times. 6,000. Many of us are happy if we get cited six times. <laughs> 6,000. Okay? Anyway, so Peter's research has been duly honored in a number of different ways. I quote just two. His election to fellow to the Royal Society, that's the, uh, the UK Royal Society in 2000. And last year he was awarded the 2012 Wilkes Award, which is a research, career research award. Plus, like Ralph Bradley, who was not only an academic leader, and here I use the word academic, I mean researchers are academic too, but I'm using it in the context of research, academic, non-research. Non so, Ralph had that balance with um, an emphasis on the uh, academic leadership. Peter um, is not only a research leader, he's given up his time generously to the profession. He's been an editor of a number of journals, the annals of probability, Peter. Statistics, Statistics, I'm sorry. I looked it up, but I forgot. Um, Academia Seneca and a number of others. I won't go into it. He's been president of the of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, the Newley Society, and a few others. And but probably his most important contribution, uh, contributions are his collaborations with younger researchers, helping them to establish a strong research platform for their own research careers. And I could keep talking, such as his record, but we only have an hour for him to talk, and I can take more than an hour just to talk about that. So instead, let us honor both Ralph Bradley and Peter Hall as Peter talks to us about um, non-parametric methods for estimating periodic functions with applications in astronomy. Talk about melding applications, the scientific world around you, science, as Ralph Bradley did, and statistical theory. Your turn, Peter. Let's welcome you.
there are some exceptions to this, of course. Sometimes there are revolutionary developments in statistical methodology, and Efron's bootstrap was one of those. It, it is uh, singular, it, it differs from some of the other um, fashions of today, uh, for example, high dimensional data analysis in the, in the sense that it, it applies to all of statistics, not just to one, one, one field. Um, but I just want to mention that I'm certainly an appreciative of uh, that these signals have. I have lost the signal. I've been talking for too long. This is my cue to say something about the talk and to change transparency. So, Patrick, I, I want to talk about this, uh, this project on estimating periodic functions. It began uh, with work with uh, John Rice. James Ryman was a PhD student of John's. The data that we analyzed were actually recorded in Canberra, and uh, but John had, had, had also analyzed them earlier in Berkeley, and it was only through this visitor from the US that I, I got direct access to these Australian data. The advantage of Australia, as any astronomy will tell you, is that because it's so well into the southern hemisphere, it looks out towards the middle of our galaxy, whereas you poor people look out towards the edge and it's pretty dull out there. We have access to much better data than you have. You can put a man on the moon and we don't have a hope of doing that, but we can see more of other moons. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the work went on to one of my own uh, PhD students, Ming Li, and worked with Marc Chanton, who's now at Kaust in Saudi Arabia, but in those days he was at, the, uh, uh, at North Carolina State University. Okay, I want to say a little bit about the history, of the, the astronomical history of uh, this problem. Basically, a periodic variable star is one whose radiation var uh, varies over time. Uh, we're used to, fortunately, the radiation we get from our own star, the sun, being fairly constant. The only reason we experience much variation, um, not generally things like... Um, sunspots and so on is because of the way in which the Earth pivots on a, a, an axis which is, um, it, it, is tilted with respect to the plane in which the Earth moves around the Sun. Or the star. Uh, and the um, uh, periodic variable star, however, is one where, the, where the, the intensity of the light changes noticeably over time. In the, in the case of the probably the first observed periodic variable star, the first one which, where we have clear records, is the uh, star uh, Mira, as I said here is Latin for wonderful. It has a period of about 332 days. Um, it was, it's been known since the beginning of the 1600s at least, uh, which is when uh, David Faber, a, an amateur German astronomer from Saxony in Germany, and his son Johannes first observed it. Uh, he originally um, thought it was a star that had, had sort of exploded and then was dying when he saw the, uh, the intensity from it uh, decrease, but then the intensity grew again, and over the uh, first um, 10 years or so of the 1600s, he noticed that it, it grew and, and, and the intensity of the radiation from the star grew and then, then decayed uh, on, on a, a cycle that was a little bit less than a year long. Um, he, like many astronomers today, was actually an amateur, as, as I said. Um, I remember being on the Australian Research Council Committee at ARC, a bit like the National Science Foundation. We were looking at physics grants as well as grants in statistics, and we, we funded a minister of religion in the west of the state of New South Wales. We gave him um, what you would call a program grant, um, even though he didn't come from a researcher and, and, and a, 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 an ARC eligible institution, he did fund these privateers from time to time. And uh, he, he has a reputation in Australia for having uh, discovered uh, uh, comets as, as well as uh, planets and so on, even though his full time job is as a minister of religion. And David Faber was of the same type. He was a minister of religion, and in fact, it was that that killed him. Um, in uh, about 1617, he, at the pulpit uh, one Sunday, he, he preached um, goodliness and godliness 
and was so bold as to accuse one of his parishioners as being a peak thief. Uh, yeah, a peak thief. And the parishioner, the parishioner took objection to this, went home and got a shovel, and came in and hit poor Mr. Faber over the head, and that was the end of that, that amateur astronomer. Um, so he had a, a rather curtailed life, but he's famous in astronomy for having um, having characterized the, um, the periodic nature of the radiation from Mira. Um, uh, Mira is a star where the, the, the radiation decays due to some, in, some aspects of the internal mechanism of the star. Um, other sorts of stars uh, are eclipsing binaries there. There are different cases where one star rotates around the other. And you can, you can imagine that if the two stars are in line relative to where you're observing them from, then the level of radiation goes down. Uh, the level of light reaching you goes down since one is hiding the other. When the stars are separated, then the level of radiation is high. So you can imagine if two stars are going around one another uh, and um, uh, you're, you're sort of sitting, you're observing them from the, the plane of, um, of rotation, uh, that you will you will get um, a fairly constant periodic variation in the light intensity that reaches you. Seconds uh, periods of uh, up to two months, sometimes only a matter of days, and the variation of their uh, radiation that, uh, comes from them. Long period variable stars have periods of up to several years. Now this is what Mira looks like. Um, the uh, the star on the right hand side. Oh, this is of course a, uh, an enhanced um, image. Uh, the, the big red, big blob starting is a, a, a red giant. I think that we go to the next. Yeah, red giant, and the, the small star to the left is um, uh, Mira B, uh, a, um, a white dwarf. Um, Mira B is, is, is very old and decaying. Mira A, the star on the right, is old, but not nearly as old as Mira B. Mira B uh, also is a variable star, but it has a period of length estimated to be around 500 years, nothing like the 332 days of the big star up there. Um, and right, the, uh, that's about it. Mirror B was discovered after its existence was, was conjectured through, uh, I think, gravitational effects. Um, uh, and it's been known for much less time than Mirror A. To an astronomer, a graph of the way, uh, on the having on the vertical axis the intensity of light from the star and having time on the horizontal axis is a graph of what's known as a light curve. The astronomers are not quite as enthusiastic about mathematics as we are, although they're very good mathematicians, many of them, um, and uh, they don't distinguish between uh, the, the mathematical model for, for, a, for a function and the, uh, the actual function itself. Uh, so they use the, light, the term light curve for both the, the real curve observed in practice and, and mathematical model for that curve, which often, almost always in astronomy, they take to be a parametric model. The, the course I'm, I'm going to talk about in, in this lecture, or the approach I'm going to talk about in this lecture, is one, of course, where we model the, the light curve non-parametrically. The advantage of doing that is that it enables us to identify characteristics of the star without imposing assumptions on what they might look like. And the advantage of this is that then we can compare different stars in, in different uh, long distances away from one another um, on the basis of the, the pattern of variability. Uh, at different wavelengths of the light, typically the light curve is observed at a variety of different wavelengths. You don't have a lot of variability, as we'll see in a minute. Um, uh, but there is variability from one wavelength to another. Um, 
and uh, uh, it's a, it's, um, this is one of the common problems that astronomers, that astronomers are trying to solve. Uh, they want to uh, do inference about light sources which are a long way away by comparing them with light sources that are relatively close to us and which we have more, more information about and they will, they will they'd like to be able to say, well, this looks so much like that in certain respects that it must be related to the radiation, that the pattern of radiation from it that is probably like that in terms of the structure as well. So this the desire to make this sort of inference really strongly motivates a, a non-parametric approach to the problem. Now, this, these data show <coughs> the two panels in uh, the, red, the red part of the spectrum, the red part of the visible spectrum and the blue part of the visible spectrum, respectively, the data we observe. Um, so what we have for each of these data sets is uh, time along the horizontal axis. Let's just look at the top two panels first. We have, <coughs> we have time along the, uh, along the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis, we have the intensity of radiation. And each of those vertical lines represents a, uh, a, the, the actual intensity that was observed, plus an error bar added onto it by the astronomers, which takes account of potential errors in intensity that arise from atmospheric effects and things like that. The astronomers, are, I find, are very good at that. Um, it's not often that you, you find that scientists assiduously give you an estimate of error for each point. Sometimes they might give you some sort of estimate of sigma squared for the whole lot. But here the astronomers, and in many other cases, although not all cases, um, give you error for each point. I also should say that astronomers are very generous in their data. Nothing at all like medical research is in my <laughs> Experience. Particularly, you don't have to pay them for their data, and you don't have to sign any confidentiality agreements. Um, okay, uh, so uh, what we see on the, on the two figures at the, uh, the two panels in the top here is that there are big gaps uh, in, these, in this data set where we observe nothing at all. And what this means is that um, uh, they were unable to make observations on the telescope over those uh, over those time periods, either because it was cloudy, maybe there was uh, you know, a month of bad weather or something like that. More likely because they didn't have time on the telescope at that point. There was there was somebody else doing experiments and they didn't have access to it at that point. Okay, now can you imagine uh, graphing, uh, so folding that horizontal axis around the circle? If the radiation from, the, from that star is varying in a periodic fashion, and if the, the circumference, the length of the circumference of the circle is exactly equal to a period, and, and then you straighten it out, what you get are the patterns in the, in the two panels at the bottom. And these are unsmoothed. All I have done to get from the top two panels to the bottom two panels is to rearrange the points modulo a good estimate of the period. And you can see that um, a child of five could draw the light curve from those data. You really don't need to use a kernel method or a spline method or anything like that. And this is a reflection of, as we'll see uh, a little bit later in the lecture, the very high degree of accuracy with which you can estimate period. We are used in non-parametric problems to be able to be able to estimate period. Sorry, to being able to estimate quantities at a, a rate of, with a rate of convergence which is somewhat slower than n to the minus a half, where n is the number of points here. Well, we can not only estimate the, the light curve at rate n to the minus a half here, we can actually do much better. Oh, sorry, we can not only estimate the period, I should say, with rate n to the minus a half, we can do much better. Uh, we can estimate period with rate n to the minus 3 over 2, where n is the number of points in either of the two panels above. So we have this phenomenon of super efficiency. Now, for those of you who are, have some familiarity with the estimation of uh, frequency in the context of time series, that will come perhaps as no surprise because it's known that in the context of parametric models for, um, uh, for the um, uh, uh, for the mean of, uh, of um, a, a time series where it repeats itself with a given frequency.
frequency, you can estimate the frequency with rate n to the minus 3 over 2. But the point here is that you don't need to have a parametric model. That you can get that convergence rate of n to the minus 3 halves, as we'll see a little later, without assuming a parametric model. All you need is a small number of derivatives, even less than 2 of the light curve that you're trying to estimate. So uh, the, the fact that if you rearrange those data points, modular, modular good estimate of the period, snaps into very sharp focus, as you can see in passing from the top two panels to the bottom two panels, is a reflection of the fact that you can estimate the period with a very high degree of accuracy. Okay, now let's introduce a bit of statistics and a bit of mathematics to describe, in, in terms of a model, what's going on here. So it's really a simple regression model, simple in some senses, familiar from some points of view. Yi equals g of xi plus epsilon i, where g represents the intensity of the light reaching you at time xi. Epsilon i is the experimental error, which the, or the, the standard deviation of which the astronomers try to, uh, try to approximate using their error bars. So xi represents the time at which I make the height observation. Usually, brightness is measured on a logarithmic scale, uh, which I don't know if you noticed, but on the previous figure, um, if you look towards the bottom of the vertical axis, you'll see that um, it's lab labeled with negative values. And that's not because uh, something's turning up the light, it's because it's on a logarithmic scale. Um, and uh, a g is the function which we'd like to estimate. That's what uh, uh, the astronomers refer to as a light curve in exactly the same way that they refer to, an e refer to its estimate as a, as a light curve. For us, it's the true regression mean, and uh, that's, uh, that's what the, the, metal, uh, the model looks like. Okay, there are a number of important departures here from the standard regression model, however, and if you cast your minds back to panels, uh, the, the data that I showed earlier, you'll recall that um, there are big gaps in, in the data, uh, so we're not going to be able to make much progress with a model which has the standard sort of infill asymptotics nature, whereas I, as I increase the sample size, the points get closer and closer together. That will be true for some points, but not for others, because there's always going to be weeks or months on end when the, the people gathering the data are not going to be able to have time on the telescope. It seems to be even more true today where you have to spend money to buy time on the telescope. And be very difficult to get on because you, you run out of money for a while and you have to get money from another grant in order to, to uh, get back. Also, of course, the observation times are not made at regularly spaced intervals. In particular, they're not made at uh, um, the same time every night, even if they're made on consecutive days. Um, my experience, the observation times are made by sleepy PhD students, at least in those days there were. These, these days they're often made by um, bits of equipment that do everything automatically and are programmed from hundreds, maybe thousands of miles away. Uh, but in, in the, these data were recorded definitely by sleepy PhD students from the Australian University. Okay, um, now, the important thing, of course, about this problem is that the function g is, is going to be taken to have, in some sense, a, a periodic structure. And the simplest form is where g of t would be able to be expressed as g of theta plus t, where, the, where theta is the, um, is the period. In fact, I'm going to take theta to be the smallest positive number for which equation 1 holds for all t, and uh, that will find what I refer to as the, as the period of the function g. So, in this simple problem, my first task is to estimate theta, and my second task <coughs> is to estimate g, once I've, I've got the value of theta. And I can accomplish this um, by a simple two-step procedure, which what I just said implies. First of all, I'm going to construct a 
Colonel Issa Mayhem, which is what um, is in the second display from the bottom here. That's a standard Nadarea Watson, Colonel Issa Mayhem, nothing more, nothing less. Um, and uh, the only difference between it and the, the one that we're all familiar with is that I'm applying it to data which has been folded, modular theta. That is, the data has essentially been wrapped around a circle. The circumference is theta, and I'm then uh, I, so I'm, I'm going to um, repeat the, the, the data over and over on a string, on, on a, an interval by wrapping them around a circle like that. So that's what this um, here represents. Oh, here, rather. Xi of theta is Xi minus theta times, respectively, the integer time of Xi of theta. That's what the wrapping formula says to me, where Xi, you call, is the time which I make the last observation. Um, I use another A Watson estimator rather than a local linear estimator because it's more robust against gaps in, in the data. Um, uh, it, it never has the form of a non-zero value divided by zero, whereas local, local polynomial methods of higher degree can, in particular local linear methods. I never have problems with edge effects for these data. So generally, the, the Nadaray Watson estimator performs better than local linear methods, for example. But um, the astronomers, as perhaps I'll see, that's how far I get before the end of the talk. But the astronomers, um, uh, more sophisticated in a variety of different ways, and in fact, I've seen them use wavelet methods too. I, I don't know why that they use wavelet methods. I think as statisticians, we would only use wavelet methods when we had some evidence that the function we were trying to estimate was a racket in some ways. Um, but uh, they also use spline methods, which makes uh, a bit more sense, or I think a lot more sense than using wavelet methods here. I should say that astronomers are very good scientists in the sense that um, uh, they're able to invent things all by themselves that uh, we have struggled with for sometimes decades. Uh, for example, in the 1970s, astronomers invented for themselves the periodogram. Uh, for statisticians, it goes back to, the, to work in the 19th century. By the 1970s, we had the periodogram well under control. You'll see the first literature on using periodogram to estimate period of periodic variable stars appears in the, in, in the astronomy journals in the 1970s with no reference to any statistics work and they made a very good job of it. So they, they did reinvent the wheel, but it was a pretty good wheel that they finished up with when they did this so stuff. I'm not being, being derogatory about them there. I'm, I'm very impressed by them, generally speaking. Okay, so have you got, have you got this estimator in the function g, function I simply do the usual trick. I subtract the estimator, the estimated value away from uh, the response variable to yi, and I look at sum of squares and I minimize it with respect to theta. I do have to choose the bandwidth of that estimator appropriately. It's a relative, relatively small bandwidth, but I can use methods based on cross validation and other ideas to choose that bandwidth. And for that bandwidth, I then simply minimize that sum of squares with respect to theta, and that gives me theta hat, which is an estimator of theta, and that's the quantity which works, um, which as I said, converges to the true theta, and um, rate n to the minus 3 over 2, as long as you've chosen your bandwidth right. Um, and then if I want to estimate the, uh, the light curve itself, that is the function g, I, I then plug into the formula for g hat that I had before, I replace the unknown theta by the theta hat that I've estimated here, and because theta hat is such a darn good estimator of theta, all of the first order properties of this estimator, this non parametric curve estimator, behave as though somebody told me the true value of theta. So black is uh, for once very kind and helpful to me, and uh, things work quite well. The astronomers um, generally use the periodogram, as I said, this approach which they invented themselves in the 1970s. Um, the very nice thing about the periodogram is that uh, I should say, in statistics, I don't think we use the periodogram all that often to estimate period today. Well, that was invented for that purpose. We, we kind of become very grown up about it. We use it for all sorts of other purposes. But the astronomers 
use it for what it was originally invented for in statistics, that is for estimating period. The nice thing about it is that uh, if you plot the periodogram, um, you, can, you can see nice regular peaks on the horizontal axis where I think you have, um, you have values of the integer part of, of, of theta over 2 pi. So you can estimate theta just by i from that graph and that suits them very well. Um, as statisticians, we can prove that we get greater efficiency in terms of our estimator of theta, of theta by using this least squares method. But uh, they're not very impressed by that because uh, they like doing it, doing, it uh, doing things by I. But uh, uh, their method really comes, you know, well their method is very useful if you want to use the least squares approach because it gives you a very good starting value when you're trying to minimize that sum of squares. It's also very useful in uh, a particularly challenging problem that I'm not going to talk about here which is where your true function g is, is actually a superposition of several periodic functions. You imagine that I didn't have a single, uh, so that my function g wasn't a simple function with a period. It was actually the sum of g1 through to gk, where k is generally unknown, uh, and each gj, each g subscript j, has period theta j. Now, that's again a case which we can solve by these squares, but I defy you when, even when k is as large as 2, to try to solve that problem by these squares because the, the, uh, the quantity that you're trying to minimize has so many local minima that it's really impossible to, to, to find them. Uh, unless, of course, you, you use a periodogram first, which gives you a preliminary estimate of what the true values of theta are, and then you can use that and you can start your Newton-Raxon procedure at the estimates that are given by the periodogram. So the method that the astronomers use has certainly um, substantial benefits. We do a little bit better as statisticians. We can get more accurate estimates by starting with their values. But nevertheless, they're very effective in what they do. Okay, now I want to start to get a little bit more sophisticated. Um, I mentioned uh, the case of a multi-periodic function, as I mentioned here in this a few minutes ago, and it's repeated here in this uh, transparency. Um, uh, this is actually a fascinating problem to work on with astronomical data. The Holy Grail, which it really seems to be very difficult to solve practically. Holy Grail problem, like all Holy Grail problems, it's very difficult to solve, is to determine the number of periodic functions that you have in your sum. I have seen articles in the astronomy literature which have up to nine different functions, all added up. I think when you see as statisticians, what they really have is a non-parametric estimate of the, uh, of, of the function g. Uh, the, the kind of uh, the scientific interest in the periods has kind of got diluted a bit by the fact that you've got so many periodic functions added up. Um, I think it's easier to determine just what's going on uh, if you look at just the first two or three uh, terms in the series. But of course, what we'd really like to do for higher, the Holy Grail problem is to be able to estimate the number of terms in the series as well as to estimate all of the periods. And that turns out to be really difficult to do effectively. Uh, I, the astronomers have various ways of doing it. I mean, obviously, sometimes you can. Um, if, if, uh, the, uh, if, if, if there's a, a marked jump down in the amplitude of your, your periodic function after some number of terms, that can be really very, very straightforward to find that jump down. But generally, you tend to get a slowly decaying um, mean squared error as you fit more and more terms. It needs some sort of clever use of AIC or something like that in order to find K. And uh, the astronomers would probably appreciate a bit of help there. But that's a problem I'm not going to talk about any longer. I'm going to talk about something which is interesting. Me a bit more, it's the problem where the period of the function and 
possibly also the amplitude of the function are changing over time. And there are some stars um, in the same class as Mira, the star I mentioned earlier, where this is believed to happen. One of the things of practical interest is to be able to conduct a hypothesis test. Suppose you, you have, um, you know, you, you've, you've got a method for dealing with inference in the case where uh, the period is changing slowly over time and the amplitude is changing. Suppose you, your estimate or, or your investigation of this problem tells you that the period is slowly decaying. Can you test that? Is there a physical test that you can develop to test the hypothesis? And uh, uh, what's, what's your answer if you apply that test? Those things are of real practical interest. So I can just talk a little bit about this. So this is what I call evolving periodic functions, where the function is basically periodic and it changes its period and its shape um, uh, through changes in, in, in the period and changes in the amplitude. We have to be a little cautious about this because if I give you, and if I give you a function which is simply a straight line, uh, I assume I, uh, um, yeah, if I give you a function which is simply a straight line and I allow you to vary its amplitude and its, and its period over an interval, you can construct um, just about uh, any function you like. If, if that straight line was always above the axis and the, uh, the um, point zero over the interval and you were looking at and all of the functions that you got by changing its period and changing its, um, its amplitude would all be non-negative of course but uh, the point here is that if you're allowed to vary period arbitrarily and vary, and vary amplitude arbitrarily there's an obvious identifiability problem uh, however if you have if you vary those two things relatively in by very small amounts, uh, so that they're just perturbations of period and perturbations of the amplitude, then the identifiability problem doesn't come into play, and it's those very small amounts, just of the order of 1% uh, or something over 100 years in the change in period. Um, and that's the sort of thing I'm going to look at in a numerical example shortly. You see that uh, the identifiability problem is not an issue. This is a problem that's been exercising the minds of both statisticians and the astronomers with which they work for quite a while. Uh, we have actually some people who are familiar to you, Hart, Kern, and Lombard. Hart is Jeff Hart of Texas A&M. Kern and Lombard are both South African. Kern is an astronomer. Lombard, some of you may have met. Fred Lombard at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, Fred retired a couple of years ago. and. Um, but he's still working with astronomer, astronomers in South Africa, uh, Kern and other and these other authors I think are all astronomers. These people have all uh, developed methods for conducting inference for um, periodic variable stars where the period is changing. Um, as I said, I'm going to look at problems where the period is uh, changing both, I'm sorry, and the amplitude is changing together. Let's look first of all at the case where just the period is changing. So I'm going to treat that problem as one where I, 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 have, I have a transformation of the, act of, the, of the time variable inside a periodic function g0. So I'm going to take um, g0 to be my function um, and it's going to be periodic. I can have a, 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 a particular period, but that will be something I'll call figure one shortly. T subscript x, this is just notation for T of x, I use the notation T subscript x, so I don't have brackets around brackets all the time. Um, but I'm thinking of a monotone transformation time. Monotone function can be either increasing or decreasing depending on whether the period is going to be increasing or decreasing over time, whether it's decreasing or increasing respectively. And um, so I'm going to try to model changes in the period of G0 by uh, having a time transformation 
Time transformation is going to be smooth, at least it's going to be sufficiently smooth, so it's not one continuous derivative. And I'm asserting here that if I look at the inverse of the derivative, that is 1 over the derivative of this function p of x at time x, that is a, that is a, a good definition of what the period of this function is at time x. Now this may look all a bit suspect, a bit suspect to you, so I'm going to try to, to convince you that that's a reasonable definition. So I just, I just repeated here that, uh, that the display formula and sentence from the previous transparency. I'm writing g of x is g0 of p of x. Let me now do a little bit of Taylor expansion. So I'm expanding g of x plus u for a little perturbation u of x. Uh, I, so I'm going to replace x by x plus u. Uh, I'm simply going to do Taylor expansion here. That's to first order, it's t of x plus the derivative of t at x uh, multiplied by the size of the perturbation u. And everything else is of smaller order than u. And let me assume that the change here is um, that the, 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 uh, the little o u term can be neglected so that the uh, I, I mean, I'm just making that as an assumption for the time being to try to make a point. So that g of tx plus the derivative of t at x multiplied by u is the actual value of g of x plus u. Then, uh, uh, the, if the function g0 had period 1, 1 over, over t dash of x would be the, the, the period of, of the function uh, for all values of u. So that really implies that if I'm, I'm doing this thing for an infinitesimal u, a very small value of u, that if I take, uh, if I'm using this, this, this little expansion to guide my interpretation of what's what here, I should be interpreting the period as being 1 over the derivative of the function d at the point x. So that's how I'm going, to I'm going to proceed. In general, I'm going to have a little mathematical model for t, not a sophisticated one. I just need something which allows for a few perturbations. And I'm going to estimate that model, and I'm, I'm going to take the derivative of that function t of x to be the same as the inverse of the, of the period of the function at time x. Now, at the same time, I'm going to allow amplitude to be perturbed, as happens in, in practice, and um, so my uh, overall, the function I'm going to get is g of x equals a of x. Uh, I, again, I put the subscript, I, sorry, I put the x as a subscript to avoid having to use too many brackets here. g of x is a of x times g naught of t of x. And uh, so this is how my function gets altered by perturbing its amplitude as well as its, as well as its period. And I can consider this function g to have period equal to 1 over the derivative of t at x and amplitude equal to a of x at time x. So all I have to do now is to prescribe little formulae for these functions. This is, uh, th these two formulae are obviously simple polynomial models for these functions. I've written them down in this, form in this manner simply for the sake of having a bit of mathematical generality, but we never go below, beyond, there never seems to be much need to go beyond two terms in either of these formulae. If I just looked at the first term here, I could simply have a model where theta 1 is, is, is the period of the function g. If I go into the second term as well, I allow a little perturbation in, in that period. Um, likewise, I model amplitude by this simple polynomial formula. But in practice, we have to go beyond the two-term approximation. So we just have a linear formula. We have a linear formula for amplitude. It's either increasing a bit with time or decreasing a bit with time depending on whether this 
brown over the omega-1 is positive or negative, respectively. And likewise, over here, we have a simple quadratic formula for Tx, which, um, where the derivative is either getting larger or smaller, depending on whether theta 2 is negative or positive. So these are the simple models we use. Uh, if I combine both of those uh, those perturbations, uh, and I go back to my original model, sort of a regression type model, I now have y and i equals g of x i plus experimental error epsilon i, where g of x has this <coughs> here with the amplitude outside and then g north of this time perturbation or this time transformation in order to accommodate the change in, in period. And we can estimate uh, the thetas. Theta is now a vector parameter. Um, we can estimate the parameters theta very straightforwardly by a slight modification of the process I talked about before. I won't get into the technical details of what everything means in the estimator, but again, we look at a standard layer, another, another A. Watson kernel estimator, which incorporates um, the amplitude function and the time perturbation function. Uh, the time perturbation function is involved when I look at the way in which I wrap the data values around the circle. Um, and I, then I, I look at this uh, sum of squares, the analog of the sum of squares I had before. I now have to min minimize it simultaneously with respect to theta, to, to the vector of theta parameters and the vector of omega parameters. And that's a relatively straightforward thing to do. And then I go and estimate theta in this way. Again, I have very fast convergence rates for the thetas as well as the omegas. I think this is uh, indicated in the next transparency. Here we are. So I'm saying that theta hat j uh, converges to the true value of theta j at this extraordinary rate, n to the minus j minus a half. Omega hat j converges to the true omega j very quickly as well. The case j equals 1 is, is the setting of, esti of estimating period by itself without having perturbation. Um, when j equals 1, you see I get order n to the minus 3 over 2 here, and that's the, that's the claim I made earlier, uh, that if you're, if you're simply estimating period in a periodic variable, so the period for a periodic variable star, and you're not um, arguing that it, the period changes over time, you get this extraordinary n to the minus 3 over 2 rate. Um, what I'm saying here is that rate persists for the base period, if you like the period of time x equals 0, um, which is theta 1, uh, and all, uh, it gets even better by a factor of 1 over n if you're looking at the rate at which the period changes. So you can get extraordinary accuracy in this problem, even though you're making only non-parametric assumptions. Here I'm assuming that the function g has two bounded derivatives, although I can get by with fewer derivatives. Okay, so let me look quickly at um, a real data set. Um, these, uh, this study was motivated by uh, a paper by a group of astronomers, one of whom uh, was at the University of Sydney, and um, they were looking at um, uh, the star uh, Hydra, which is in the Hydra galaxy, which is a galaxy um, that you could be visible, I think, with the naked eye from Earth, and it's um, named after Hydra is some sort of many-headed creature in Greek mythology. And so if you join the stars up with the lines in the right places, you get something which you, at least if you were Greek, you could see with like a creature in the stars, in the sky, that had many heads. The problem in Australia is that all these things are upside down. So, I should say, you have an upside down. We see it the right way. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's got, it's got, it's got many legs rather than many heads. <laughs> um, okay, so um, these data were recorded over a uh, little over 100 years, uh, 101 years to be precise, and um, they're analyzed by a group of 
astronomers, um, one of them at the University of Sydney, as I said. Um, we decided to analyze them so ourselves. They use wavelength. These are the, this is a bunch of astronomers who use wavelength methods to uh, estimate the period, the amplitude change, the light curve, and everything else. Uh, we, still haven't, we still haven't figured out what made their method work, why on earth they use the method that they use, and we get quite different results from I'll put up some pictures in a minute. Um, in my, these astronomers argued, looking at data in the first half of this century, from 1900 to 1950, um, actually it's 102 years, I guess, because it goes up to 1901. Um, uh, they argued that the period um, declined uh, and that the amplitude also declined in that time. Um, we, we, I think, uh, agreed with that. I'll say more in a minute. Um, but I, I, when we, uh, so th these are the original data here. Um, you, the reason why these data appear to be stacked is each line here really, each vertical line really corresponds to observing the star at a, a bunch of closely spaced points in time because the time axis is so compressed it looks like it's, um, the one, one is above the other but you'll see they're all slightly different times and of course it's magnitude or brightness on the vertical axis and the gaps between the vertical lines are times when the, the astronomers couldn't get time on the, on the telescope so they weren't able to record the star at that time so that's why it looks like a pack of vertical lines the uh, top panel is the first 51 years, and the lower panel is the next 51 years. So observations. Um, we fitted our model, and we got uh, uh, a, 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 I think this corresponds to a decrease. Yeah, OK, so I think it too had negative. It does correspond to a decrease in period. I think I got this up a little bit earlier. So, um, uh, this would actually that the period we got a decrease in period, but we actually got an increase in amplitude. Um, this is the data over the first 50 years. For the data over the second 50 years, uh, our colleagues um, got an increase in the amplitude, um, but a, a decrease in the period. Um, let me just point to two fits to the data. Um, the, the top panel and the bottom panel are uh, fits to the data using our method after we have made an allowance for the change in period and the change in amplitude. So for the first 50 years, the bottom panel is for the last 50 years. So you can see there's not a lot of evidence in the top panel and the bottom panel of some periodicity that we've missed out. But for our friends, the astronomers, this is what happens when you do the same thing for their estimate. So somehow they're made using their, um, this, is, this is just for the first 50 years. That's the first 50 years for us, and that's the second 50 years for them. Somehow their wavelength method has led them astray They've missed out a lot of, um, of, of changes in the period, which really are important if you want to get the light curve, if you want to estimate the light curve for this star uh, accurately. All right, I'll end there. We're getting close to half past five. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes? What are the, uh, the, the top curve is much more dispersed than the bottom. Yeah. Is, is that yeah. just because the instruments have gotten uh, so much better so over time? There, there is a slight change of scale. But uh, I think the point is that the, the periodic curve model, so if you come here, you can see there is evidence of um, slightly more dispersion up here on, on the left hand side. So the periodic, the evolving periodic model doesn't fit as well to data in the first 50 years as it does to data in, in the second 50 years. There is a slight change in scale, 
this goes up to 10 here, and it starts at 4. This scale starts at 5 and, and goes up to, up to 9. So um, the vertical axes are not quite the same, but it is true that the, the periodic, uh, the, the model with a, um, with a evolving amplitude and evolving period doesn't fit, it doesn't explain as much of the variability for the first 50 years as it does for the second. It has year. nothing to do with the resolution of telescopes or whatever? Would it um, I don't think there was a sharp change in 1950, put it that way. Okay. There would be changes over time. I don't know the origins of, uh, I don't know where these data were recorded. They're probably recorded somewhere in Australia, probably um, at the Siding Springs Observatory in New South Wales. But, uh, and obviously there had been a change, there would have been changes in um, accuracy over time, but I don't think there was a sharp change in 1950. just make a comment, I assume you got interested in this. I didn't say this when I introduced him, that he spent many years at Australian National University, and of course there's a very famous observatory just outside. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So the original data set that I, turn this off now, the original data set was actually observed at Mount Stromlo, I think, yeah. um, which was destroyed yeah. by fire about 2004. Uh, it's still not functioning. Uh, it's used more as a tourist uh, place to show tourists old telescopes and things. I don't think they do any serious astronomy there now. But it was a world class astronomy. Well, um, as, I, as, we, as I ask you to uh, thank Peter, um, I, I suppose I can say this, Peter. Uh, his mother was a, a world class astronomer. And I suppose when he was born, she said, ha-ha, a star is born. <laughs> 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 <laughs>